Uh, my name is Sisha Maharaj and I lead business development in the full-time MBA program at the Rotman School of Management, UFT. So what I do is I help companies find great talent uh, at the MBA level. So my name is Chris Dudley. I'm the Director for Entrepreneurship at Seneca. Uh, part of my responsibilities is looking after our incubator, which is called Helix. Uh, we help um, students develop the entrepreneurial mindset, which can lead to being absolutely great employees and innovate from within as entrepreneurs or as entrepreneurs, and we help them uh, scale and, and launch. Cool. Well, uh, uh, I, think I think we have one, one more. One more, I'm sorry. I uh, can go if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Rod Suraj. I'm the manager of client engagement at the Water Technology Acceleration Project. We're a not-for-profit um, not for profit ecosystem builder for water, early stage water technology innovations coming out of Ontario. We work with the te technology companies that have a new innovation to address water needs of a giant corporation like a Coca-Cola or a small village in Ghana. Nice. Cool. Well, I think one of the big questions on the minds of, of our audience in, in general is funding for uh, R&D for green tech, clean tech. Um, how, how can the major players fund and support innovation and the development of new clean technology outside their companies? How can they stimulate innovation in startups? So, um, can I Please, uh, sure. whoever wants to go first. So, um, the, the global in a, uh, clean tech innovation fund or index um, ranks Canada number fourth in in support of, of clean tech and uh, uh, industries and they're first in funding which is amazing and second in early support um, and that early support I think uh, stems from universities as well as is colleges who who really get in there and, and provide incubators but also talent, education, and, and support in developing um, that clean tech um, uh, ideas and ventures. I think the other big uh, proponent, proponent of this is that partnership with industry, where um, it's not just universities acting alone, it, it's universities and colleges working together and then bringing in the broader ecosystem to support those, those launches. Um, I would just add from the talent side that there is um, some support to hire, you know, fresh minds on an internship basis, as well as full time across many different sectors, especially on the clean tech side. So, for example, uh, Eco Canada is one of the third party. I would say agencies that the government has partnered with and uh, they would give you up to 50% of an internship salary uh, specifically in this space as one example. Uh, the government has also given some money to research bodies to help you with research so to further the advancement of innovation in this space as well such as MyTax. Uh, they have over 200 million dollars that they were given for research so again it's working together with universities industry as well as um, colleges um, to support innovation and research uh, as well as hiring talent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so Water has been around for about six years or so, and when we started, there wasn't much of a sense of what was happening in the water technology space. And to, your question, to answer your question, I, I just want to give you a little bit of premise of what the te water technology ecosystem in Ontario looks like. A lot of people don't know that we've had a little bit of a mini, mini Silicon Valley in the water space happen in the last 15, 20 years in, in Ontario. If you went swimming a few decades ago in Lake Ontario, you would come up with a diaper around your arm. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that filthy. But we managed to clean it up because water has been so central. It's, it's a big part of the prosperity, economic prosperity, social prosperity of Ontario and Canada. Water is integrally, uh, very integral to that. So we've done a good job at cleaning up the water. So we have all these innovations and, and, and technologies that can address fresh water issues, water quality issues. What's happened is that in the last few years, we've had some major successes, huge uh, acquisitions by multinational companies, but the talent and the money has stayed in the province, leading on to more roll-on companies. We've got much more leadership happening in the areas of not only the traditional sectors like wastewater treatment, drinking water treatment, but also we're seeing an increasing convergence of machine learning, AI, and these other disciplines that have not been a part of water for some time, but now we're seeing it approach water and, and build new solutions. So the reason for, all this, uh, for saying all this is that 
R&D is a very big part of uh, any water technology innovation. Not only in terms of because water technology innovation is, has traditionally been very infrastructure heavy, so if you're going to work with a water, a water treatment utility, it's very massive, you got very big systems, very, lots of components in systems that can come from different technology spaces. But also when you talk about these emerging fields like, again, machine learning or AI, you have to look at how these systems can address the issues of water. water uh, the water sector is heavily regulated for good reasons because if something goes wrong at your local water treatment facility, millions of lives could be at, at stake. But having said that, there is a way to streamline regulations and because technologists have to address regulatory uh, limits, there is a bigger, much more important need for it. So definitely access to talent, access to capital is huge. And so ministries can work in this area. Venture, we're seeing an increasing number of non-traditional water investors come into the sector, who are, who are not just clean tech, but other areas as well, who want to play a part in water now. Th that was a striking visual image of swimming in Lake Ontario and coming up with a diaper wrapped around your arm. I can't get that out of my head now. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, let, let's have a conversation with the audience. It doesn't have to be, you know, just talking heads. Do you have, do you have any, any questions or, or ideas uh, that we want to discuss uh, around those points? Quiet audience I, today. But I'm going to add Please do. something. It, it, there is uh, support in the industry um, from government for, for funding and, and obviously universities and colleges for applied research and incubator support. Um, but there's no wrong door, and I think that's what we want to stress here, that um, you may, may come in with uh, just an idea and go, you know, I, this is what I want to do. There's a place in Ontario that you can start developing that. You're perhaps not ready to connect in with WaterTap, but that's okay. There's no wrong door. We can help get you to a spot that then you connect in and then move further. And I, I look out to the, the audience and um, an amazing group that has come through a connection with, with LATAM, and I'm going to play all the dots here, so follow me. <laughs> so from Mexico, connect into LATAM, and there, uh, Chris and Carlos right here from uh, Nautilus Innovation Lab. Well, starting at you now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Connect into LATAM, connects into to Helix. They work in Helix, start connecting into the broader ecosystem, meet up with WaterTap, connect not right yet, go back, continue to develop. Now they've got uh, their MVP that's spot on. Continue the conversation. Now it's getting close to that time to continue to develop. Mm -hmm. We're connecting them with funding. They're about to get Seneca buying their uh, a product. And it's all these connecting of the dots. It's no one group. It's mm -hmm. everyone working together at the right time, at the right spot. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. It's, it's funny you brought up that story because it's, so we met Carlos and Chris via the Ministry of International Trade. Yeah. We yep. snuck them into our conference, <laughs> got some wine. I started to chat. I was blown away by what they were developing. It was quite fascinating. You know, we have Alan from uh, Ministry of International Trade behind you as well. They, yeah. I'm just, I should meet them. Um, and then through Carlos and Chris, I met Miriam, and now I'm here, right? Yeah. And then also started to listen to her, hear about what you were doing at Helix, Chris. And so it's really, really fascinating. So part of what we've been trying to do in the last few years is really to build a sense of what a ramp looks like. Right? Yep. There is no wrong door. You're absolutely right. And we have to work better together. And it's something that we haven't done for a long time in Ontario, but I think we're getting better at it. I agree. Which is what we need to do. Yep. Awesome. Well, certainly our interest in, at, the, at this conference is the intersection between clean tech, green tech, and opportunities and challenges in Latin America, where there is often far less budget for R&D and, uh, but also potential for widespread de deployment and indeed the alleviation of great human suffering. Um, so, uh, so, so what are some of the, uh, how can we recognize and reward the, the creations of Latin American entrepreneurs working in the green tech, clean tech space, often on a shoestring budget? How can we encourage them 
from here, if at all? Well, I'll jump in again. <laughs> um, um, so I think the, the first and foremost is that a, a connection into uh, LATAM. Um, that opens up a lot of doors. Um, obviously, the U of T's of the world, the Seneca's of the world, the, the water taps of the world can't be understanding what's happening in Latin America all the time. But you guys are close to that. You understand that. And you start creating pathways into, um, into Canada where we can then start getting them into the right spots. Uh, at Seneca Helix, um, we, we don't take a percentage of, of the company. We don't charge to, for what we do. Um, it is open for non-Seneca students. Um, that's what we do. So we start having incredible groups. Like I come back to, to Nautilus. Uh, uh, Agramaha was here earlier. Um, coming in and, and getting a, a foothold into the Canadian and Ontario marketplace and from that, using these uh, amazing connections and networking to broaden their, their sphere and, and continue to, to develop without sacrificing um, what they, uh, they've done and what they've, they've earned along the way. And also, I think that there's different ways to get involved as well. So within, you know, the ecosystem of universities and colleges, there's a number of different incubators that are open not just to students. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, at the Rotman School of Management, you know, we've got the Creative Destruction Lab, and there are three different streams, and right now it's open for applications. It's global applications. So, you know, an invitation to, you know, globally, um, especially within the, the Latin community where we've got a number of our students from the Latin community um, that are in our program right now. We've got 350 students, um, and increasingly we're seeing talent coming from the region. So I think that a way to, to encourage individuals is, you know, to invite them to connect with us, either applying to incubators. Uh, we also have opportunities right now where the applied learning. So give us your toughest problems. Uh, give us some of the things that you're, you're thinking about, and let's work together. I think one of the things that amazes me, I've been at U of T now 10 years, uh, is the increasing amount of collaboration that I'm seeing with industry, with faculty, and with students. So, for example, you know, we've got courses on sustainability strategy that looks at you know, the value chain uh, in sustainability, not just the technology, but looking at your process. And you know, having guest speakers coming into the classroom, but also giving us challenges or problems that our students can work on. So there are many different opportunities um, that we can work together to encourage that knowledge transfer. So mm -hmm. you know, getting into the classroom, you know, working on real life problems. Um, we also do global consulting projects as well. So we encourage our students to get outside of our uh, out of Toronto um, and to go global. And we've got a number of a great alumni working, you know, within uh, the within Latin America, but across the world as well. So I think that another opportunity is just sharing information. Uh, we've got different institutes as well where we're having open collaboration and an open sharing of data. Um, and that's another area where I feel that, you know, we can really work together to really understand not just, you know, the emerging areas, but also sort of the collective knowledge in the space. So there are lots of opportunities where we can, we can contribute uh, in terms of sharing of knowledge um, and also sharing the talent. I think that uh, our students are really, really interested in working with clean tech and green tech. Um, I mean, I sat in some of the classes, and it's amazing to hear the stories and the diversity, uh, not just within this sector, but what you can learn from other verticals. Um, and they're really keen on that. So we encourage them to participate with art, um, entrepreneurs, with, with startups as well. Um, someone recently asked me, like, how do you teach entrepreneurship, right? Well, you've got to do it. So it's like roll up your sleeves, exactly. work, with the, work with the startups. Um, we have a number of different classes, you know, as I mentioned. Another one is working with the Creative Destruction Lab where they actually get partnered with startups. They work in teams. And they help the startups directly with business development, with marketing, um, helping them, you know, do market testing. Um, and it's within teams of, of individuals, not just, you know, in one program, but in multi-programs across UFT. So I would say that those are a few ideas. But definitely if there's an, a need or there's a question, then um, I think it would be great for, for us to have that conversation and see how we can work together. I'll add that, um, so... <laughs> I was in China in um, September last year. So, you know, China is arguably the largest 
uh, market for uh, water technologies in the world. Having said that, it's also quite a complex and a large market. So saying China itself is kind of useless. You have to say even a niche market in China is 30 million people, <laughs> bigger than all of Canada combined probably. Um, but what the interesting, one of the interesting things that we kept getting from that is that, look, Ontario is recognized as the leader in freshwater and wastewater technologies in the world. But often it's too sophisticated for that market. So there's a need for low-cost uh, context specific solutions and this is depend you know depending on where you are the shoestring budget is not a bad thing if you don't actually have money that's a bad pro you know that's an issue but if you don't have money it's a creative creative limitation in a place like Ontario where there's world-class R&D so if you have the right context so you too would know what the right context for your solution uh, is and you know you bring that idea and that knowledge base and you say okay the R&D has to be applied this way bring the cost down to this point this is the limit, uh, the least it has to do. What does the MVP look like? That's where it becomes very useful, I think. And that's sort of where coming here, develop a solution, and then scaling it and commercializing it for the rest of the world is quite useful, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, for example, we have uh, a project. It's an uh, eolical uh, uh, clean energy by wind. Mm -hmm. But we have the prototype. And we and we need to we want to develop, but I I gonna ask you if it's a good idea to develop the project in a university or what do you, what do you think is the best option? <laughs> so <laughs> um, there there's uh, universities and colleges that are are there that can do. Um, help you in two, both ways. Uh, from your applied research side, perhaps you need some more applied research to, to get it moving further, faster, less expensive, what, what have you. As well as incubator to help develop you know, your, your business plan, your marketing, uh, connections, et cetera, et cetera. Universities and colleges can, can provide that and then network you into the broader uh, ecosystem. As I mentioned before, there's no wrong door. Uh, you know, we work with universities. Universities work with us, and and that is not just uh, Seneca. That's across the whole system, right? So I get back to that no wrong door. Um, but what you, what I would su suggest is that you do a little bit of research because there's certain um, institutions that will have perhaps a niche focus in in different areas. And that's probably where you want to go first, right? Because if they have a, a niche focus in um, wind energy, then that would I would go go there, right? Even though Seneca is was great, U of T is great, but if another university has that focus, go there. I I, I bet you you'll eventually end up connecting into U of T at some point and potentially connecting into us as well when the time is right. But do your research first. And also networking. I mean, it's a great question. Um, and what I would say is it depends on what you need at the stage at where you're at. Yep. And, you know, you can actually see, experience different incubators or different accelerators at different times of where you're at. So I would talk to people and inquire. Also take a look at who are, who's leading research in, in wind as an example. Uh, also here at Mars as, as another example. Totally. They have a, a cluster specifically focused uh, here on, on clean tech, um, if I'm not mistaken. So there are many different areas where you can partner. Um, and if you go to one, it doesn't mean that you can't go to others later on. It really depends. Or at the same time. Sometimes. Or at the same time. And, right. and the other thing I would also suggest is uh, there's a network of mentors. Uh, you heard entrepreneurs and residents, individuals that have had success stories in certain different areas. One of the things you could do as part of your research is take a look at who are the mentors, who are the advisors, um, and maybe talk to some of the, the companies that were a part of that accelerator or incubator, um, because it's, it's, it could be daunting, but there is a shortcut in, in terms of just talking with individuals um, and, and taking a look at those, those key parts of their structures. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Staffing uh, R and D for clean, clean tech, green tech can be difficult. How do we solve the challenge of, of developing talent, recruiting talent, and keeping talent? 
to really drive this sector forward? That's a great question. Um, I'll jump in. My favorite question. Um, so, although you know everyone goes to financing, you know I would argue that human capital is probably the most important decision you're going to make as an entrepreneur. Um, and I feel that uh, if you have the right people, um, I think someone said it earlier. You know, today um, I think Manny said it that amazing people want to work with amazing people. It's like a magnet. Um, and I think that is really, really important. Your human capital strategy. Um, and just to give you an idea of the size of the market, here in Canada, according to uh, some recent labor information, uh, in across all the provinces, we have over 800,000 people currently working in some sort of tech role. Um, in an environmental or a core environmental role, it's over 360,000, and that's according to Echo Canada, who have been doing research in this area for a long time. Um, and so if you look at the experienced market or what the current market looks like, that's sort of the landscape in, in Canada. Um, in Ontario, um, we have about 6% of our of our. Uh, labor force working uh, in, in this area as well. So you've got the experience market um, in terms of your talent pool, but we also see or expect that this is going to be growing. I mean, you mentioned about the, the expertise in water. Um, so we see that this is growing and some of the areas that it's growing and it's changing all the time. So I would say that we need to work together. Um, I, I met up with another employer and, you know, he was joking with me and he's like, you need to train them faster, you know. I said, well, you need to work with me to let me know what is the knowledge and skills that you're looking for so that we can work together. So, again, I think collaboration is the key here. There are some hard technical skills that you need and there are some programs that exist. Um, I do recommend Echo Canada uh, because there are some free online training there's some certifications there but within the you know the university and college system there are a number of majors a number of specialties um, we're also trying to make it simpler for you to understand how we're training and developing the talent so for example uh, across you know U of T there's three different uh, campuses and each campus has a different specialty or major like the UTM uh, example in Mississauga they have different programs than we would have at St. George as an example so you know, I would say that if you're looking at the emerging talent um, or looking at new and innovative minds and problem solving, uh, helping you to solve some of the issues that you're thinking about, um, partnering with universities and colleges is a great way for us to work together. So I think the first step is letting us know, you know, what are the skills and knowledge that you need? What are the gaps that you're seeing? Um, also, what is it that we don't see? What is emerging? What do you think is happening? And, you know, I would challenge people to also take a look at the talent in a different lens, not not just looking at knowledge and skills and competencies, but I would challenge you to think about what is the outcome that I need for my business line? Um, who are the founders of the leadership? And what is the expertise that I need to build a really strong leadership team? I would also challenge you to think about one competency that, you know, everyone's talking about the future of work. Well, the reality is, who knows what it's really going to be. Um, and I would look at talent or when you're speaking with individuals, look at their ability to learn. Because the more and more I look at job descriptions and the more and more I talk to companies who are hiring across every industry, you know, things are changing. Jobs are existing now that never existed before. So in terms of being able to identify and develop talent, I would say we need to do it together. We need to have conversations together so that we're working together to develop curriculum and, to, you know, again, using the problems that you have right now so that students are developing the knowledge and skills that you need right away. So the great thing that I'm really excited about that's happening right now in Ontario is the focus on work-integrated learning. So what that means is that every single student needs to have some kind of applied learning before they graduate. And this is a huge opportunity, I think, for industry and for startups to help to train the talent. Uh, but the ability to learn how to learn, I think, is critical. The other competency that I would look at is entrepreneurial uh, competency, um, and we could have we have research a lot of research on this what that means and people have different opinions, um, but I guess what I would say is that you're in an, a marketplace where we've got experienced talent um, that exists already, but we also have emerging talent, and this is an area that I'm seeing with our students and our alumni that you know they're really interested in getting involved. Um, in, in, in this space. So, for example, one of our alumni right now is working together on the Rainmaker project. I don't know if you've heard of that one. Um, and using solar, using solar technology uh, to extract water and to create wells in areas where they don't have infrastructure or they don't have systems, and using this as a mode to create peace, employment, um, and to help farming in, in very, very um, sort of areas that are isolated uh, in, in, South, in Africa. 
Um, so we've got students that are very motivated and interested. We have faculty that are researching in this area. Um, so I think we just need to work together uh, in terms of, of that. So from a sourcing of talent, you know, the world, really Canada is open to you um, and you can get the experience, individuals, you can get fresh thinking. But I also think that there's an opportunity and a real, real important need for us to work with the younger students in high school. Um, because again, I always say I feel like I'm in the future and we need to go back into the you know, earlier days to make sure we plant those seeds with students so they understand the link between what they're learning in school and what that could be as a career. And just to plant the seed and to spark that curiosity because I feel that this is what we are missing is we need to continuously develop that pipeline and help to make the connections at every stage um, of education uh, in the system. I can go on forever on this topic, but um, you have no to passion add. at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, do you want to jump or me? I can go, okay. unless you have you, popcorn you go style. And then I got some all right, stuff. cool. Because right. I really like some of the things that you really said, and I took notes. Uh, okay. Really resonated strongly with me. Um, so one of my favorite uh, bloggers, Dave Graham, uh, he started Netscape and then started Y Combinator. I go to his blogs every now and then, and I remember a quote from him that's so obvious, it kind of sounds, it almost sounds stupid, but it's really true. He said that the easiest way to be an entrepreneur is to be entrepreneurial, right? And the fact of the matter is, what does that mean? It means that have an attitude, be curious, get shit done. Yep. Yeah. That's, yep. really, that's really the bottom of it. I think entrepreneurship has been talked about for a while, but from the perspective of starting companies and things like that, but what's more important is to be entrepreneurial. Having that mindset that, you can fail and it's okay because with the failure, at least you have a yes or no. If you don't try, then you don't know. That yeah. The question is always exists, right? So, you know, and there's other saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. And if you don't have the right people, then it doesn't matter what you're going to do. And in fact, I totally believe when VCs put money into a company, they put money into the people, not the solution itself. Yeah, solution will only take you that far, but if you're not able to execute, then it won't work. So, you know, from our perspective, I think the, the, going to your point, I think talent is so critical. And this is where the universities uh, have a huge role to play in creating the right environments for their entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurial behavior that you want. And it's then it's up to ecosystem creators like us or companies out there to create the right context in which that entrepreneurial spirit can thrive. And you see, give them the right problem set, the right things to achieve for an entrepreneurial person. From our perspective, an entrepreneurial person really looks at three key things. You know, they look at convergence. In a world where we're inundated with data, one can say that we're more fragmented than ever before. There's an opinion about everything, on a political lens, social lens, on a technological lens. And a lot of what solutions we're talking about today is very speculative. We actually don't know. Uber was the greatest thing when it came up, and look what's happening now. You understand the management practices? It's going to go down to the dumps, right? And there's really nothing proprietary or it's a solution, which is why any startup can do what they're doing. Um, and then there's the ability to collaborate despite conflict. Collaboration is a very uh, buzz, hot buzzword, but the fact is if you're not able to navigate conflicts within your team, with the, outer, the world outside your organization and company, it's going to be a problem. And the last, I think... If companies are looking for high-class talent, they really have to talk about purpose. I think the new workforce really cares deeply about purpose. Why is it that I'm Absolutely. doing what I'm yeah. doing? Absolutely. It's really critical to answer that question. Yeah. Um, sorry, are there a question? I saw you raise your hand, so I thought you had something. Okay, never mind. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm done. So, talent is water. It will flow, right? You cannot hold it. It will just flow. So. I there's a couple of things from my uh, my perspective. One is um, hire right. Understand what it is that you're truly looking for. Be open. Be honest about what it, the the job entails, um, and and get it right the first time. Because if you don't, it, there's so much cost associated with it and potential damage associated with it. Start your retention strategies the first day that they are in employed by you, right? And what I mean by that is that feedback loop, those connections to make sure that they are enjoying what they do. They are not 
feeling as though they were sold a bill of goods, and they are not looking to walk out the door. Next, I would suggest it, it's got to be a, a, your culture. Um, it's got to be um, f- from the the lowest to the highest. This feeling that um, I can innovate from within. I can do these things. I, it's okay if I fail. That's all right. Um, I am going to be supported because if you don't have that culture, once again, your talents water. It will flow out. So you've got to keep um, hiring right, talking to them, connecting to them, and making sure that your back processes support what it is that they want and what you need. Right. The other is if you're early stage, it's going back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, you may not have the talent uh, you know, or the ability to hire talent, and you don't want to give up your, uh, parts of your company just yet. So use uh, re- uh, resources around you, like applied research at, at colleges and at universities, to get access to great talent to move you forward so that you get to a point where, okay, now I can start looking at hiring uh, somebody. Right, um, so it, it's right when you're just bootstrapping. There's ways to get great talent or access to great talent. Once you got and you you're starting to hire, there's other ways to connect in, and then you've got to do your due diligence. That's well, yeah. that was a wonderful discussion. I'm afraid we are out of time. So so please give a warm thank you to our our panelists.